Thank you so much, Pastor Heidi. Give it up for your pastor. Oh my gosh, this tiny little woman, she's so sweet. You're the best, you're the best. You guys, this is so special, what's happening in this place. Like, I don't know why I'm getting overwhelmed right now, but why do we say that when you've been saved for like 20 years? I don't know what it is. It's the, it's the Holy Spirit, Hillary. It's the Holy Spirit. I don't know why I'm crying. I want what you guys have. But it's just not normal for people to come so hungry. And I was looking around. You guys can, like, piano, like, give it, yeah, for sure. Um, like, not just hype hungry, but I see people, like, kneeling in their chairs in the back and um, people, like, in the rows just, like, warring for something. And then I, the woman who got baptized, I mean, amazing. Wherever... Wherever you are, thank you for sharing your story. And then I walked into the lobby to go to the bathroom and her daughter was in the lobby crying. Like that your mom, I mean, it's just not normal. Like the generational thing that's happening here and the hunger that you guys have. So thank you, Pastor Heidi and Chad for creating a place for that. It's not normal. So you guys should feel very blessed to have this. Um, you can be seated. I would love it if you stood the whole time if I'm being totally honest. I feel like I'm not alone when like we're standing up together. It's so fun. We're all in this together. Um, I had heard about Pastor Heidi from my good friends several times. And um, they were just, do you, anybody use Marco Polo? The app Marco Polo? I have two good friends. Oh, there your, there's your faces. Oh, hallelujah. Um, we talk on Marco Polo like every day. And they would always bring up, oh, well, you know, when we talk to Heidi, like, we could talk to Heidi, and like, oh, you should talk to Heidi. And I'm like, am I, who, who in our church is named Heidi? Like, I don't know who Heidi is. And they're like, well, Heidi King, Heidi King. I'm like, okay. And then I had a new neighbor move in down the street, and she came over one time. She's like, well, my cousin's uncle, brother, sibling, well, they go to church with Heidi and Chad, Heidi King. I'm like, okay, who is this popular woman, Heidi, who everybody wants to be her friend and talk to her? And apparently, I need to know her. And then one day on Instagram, I opened up my messages and I had a message from Heidi King. And I was like, is this a joke? Like, is this real? Am I being reached out to by Heidi? So I texted Tasha, my friend at the father's house in Vacaville. And I said, is this a mistake? Like, do you think she meant to? And she's like, no, I told her like, hey, if she ever needs a speaker, reach out. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna write her back. I'm gonna know Heidi King. And then I, <laughs> I know I do, I know Heidi King. You guys do, we should all be very proud of ourselves. She and Chad showed up to our pastor's network gathering where a bunch of pastors get together and network. Um, yeah, the name speaks for itself. And I got to meet her and sit at the dinner table with her and she walks in. I'm like, there you are, this legend. And like, I can't wait to come to your women's night. And then we do stuff. And then the next morning we meet back up for like coffee and fellowship. And uh, she walks in and I didn't recognize her because I guess the night before she must have had heels on. And she walks in into the lobby of our church the next morning and she's like, oh, hi. Like, like, what's the problem? It's me. It's me, Heidi King. I'm like, wait, what? Like, I was, she's like, oh, I must, I must have had heels on last night. Like, oh, nonchalant. And I'm like, why didn't you tell me you were so small? Like, I had no idea. So like this woman who's like leading this women's movement in Santa Rosa, pastoring this church with her husband, leading worship, taking care of us, this tiny little powerhouse, that's your pastor. That's her. That's her. And Heidi, thank you for shepherding women when you have your own family that you could be shepherding. And I know you're shepherding your family, but that's a sacrifice. That is a huge sacrifice to raise kids who love the house of God and love their parents and then say, and also I'm going to give my time to make sure that something happens in Santa Rosa, to make sure that something happens in Northern California. That is someone who is sacrificing a great deal. So give it up for your pastors one more time. Yes, 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 yes. We honor you. We honor you. Honor you. We honor you. She said, why am I crying? It's the Holy Spirit. We honor you. And I'm just, I'm like, are you, I'm still like, are you sure you went, meant to invite me? Are you good? Are we good? When I saw you worshiping, I'm like, I think we're good. They got it. Like they have the Lord. 
I think we're just keep going in worship. Um, I would love to show you guys my picture of my family. There we are, huge, on the Jumbotron. <laughs> this is my family, aren't they sweet? Um, my husband Rich and I have been married for almost eight years. Love of my life, best friends. They say there's no such thing as soulmates. I'm like, I beg to differ. He is the gym to my Pam. In fact, in fact, we met at church and I was the church receptionist and he was the janitor. So there was lots of front desk walkbys. And he's like, hey. And he would get rebuked all the time by the church admin who'd be like, you need to keep moving, buddy. Like, I don't want you hanging out. Our executive pastor, Pastor Mark Seiger, would be like, hey, buddy, you can't hang out by the reception desk, okay? But guess what? We got married. We had babies. It worked out. So that's us. <laughs> He is um, a worship pastor at our church, and he's also in charge of part of our school of ministry, and I am on the teaching team at our church. So we kind of just like served our way into leadership. We were kids at the Father's House in Vacaville, and then we were like, I guess we'll be youth leaders, and then we're like, I guess we'll be youth pastors, and then one day Dave's like, well, you're like the teaching pastor, and you guys are hired, and I'm like, is that how that happens? You just keep serving, and then one day they're like, oh, we'll pay you money now. I'm like, that works. That works for us. So... That's what we've been doing for the past six years. Um, our youngest here is Millie, Millie Taylor, and she is, this is a year old, so she is a year now, and she just started walking, and she is my baby. By every definition of the word, she is my baby. She was 10 days overdue, and then she was born at home on purpose. I did that by choice. <laughs> yeah, that was on, on purpose. She was born at home, but she is my baby, and she's the last one, Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs> All done, all done. Everybody say, all done, all done. Yeah, we're done. So it's over now. And then the middle one is with the socks. That's Haven. Haven's just like me. And it's the worst. It is the worst. It's the best and the worst. No, I love her and save me because it's, it's hard. She's really hard. And I love her to death. And it's just because she's me. It's, it's really hard to raise yourself. Because I found out after having her that I'm extremely difficult and stubborn and independent and emotional and all the things. I like how the music like swelled as I said that. <laughs> You're good. You're like, I'm following you. I'm following track. Our last one is, J our, our first one, I'm going back to front here. First one is Jane Margaret Harris, our beautiful princess angel. Uh, at three days old, she's five now. She just started kindergarten. It's pretty crazy. At three days old, she had a life-threatening random blood sugar mishap. It was an accident and her blood sugar crashed to like zero and she was basically code blue and it, uh, they didn't know if she would survive and I'll never forget that feeling of trauma and because of that moment, I did deal and still do deal with a lot of PTSD um, and attacks of anxiety and panic because that moment was so um, abrasive against my heart. And I remember them wheeling her off to the ER, but she survived and we spent a month in the ICU. Ever since then though, it caused lifelong seizures and she is disabled. She is blind and she's cognitively delayed and she can't walk. Um, so we go down south for her neurological care. So we go to Orange County, we drive eight hours because that's where the best care is. And so one trip about a year ago, we drove down south with just Millie because she was about this age and then Jane and my husband in Haven stayed at home for all the reasons because it was an eight hour drive and need I say more. So we brought her down and we went to the hospital and we drive down for a one hour appointment eight hours for one hour appointment, two kids, one hour appointment. It's just what we have to do to get the best care. And they just want to see her in the clinic, make sure she's good, I guess. So we knew what we were in for, but that's what we do. Um, and the news was just like the same. It wasn't good. It wasn't bad. It was just the same. And my heart was like agitated. Like, God, really? Like, we've been in this for five years and you don't have new news for me? You, I, we can't drive to, you know, Oakland, we have to drive to Orange County. Why is it the same? And my husband, who is just annoyingly like cheerful or like optimistic, like irritatingly optimistic, I'm like, don't be happy right now. Like, let's be sad, you know, like this is the time. He's like, you know what? Let's not think about it. Let's just go into downtown Disney and like, you know, find a cheap bite to eat in a nice quiet place in downtown Disney, right? Yeah. Okay. Ex ex you get the joke. So we go to downtown Disney, 
we should not have done this. I'm like irritated, like I'm wrestling in my spirit. I'm dealing with some anxiety. And we go and sit in the middle of downtown Disney at that Uva bar in the middle, if any of you been to downtown Disney. And we order some real cheap food. Yeah, right. And then we're all just, we're just like irritated at each other. We can't put our finger on it, you know? So I get up from the table and I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to take Millie and we're going to walk. We're going to walk. And so he's like, fine. I get up and I happen to see the bill that we paid for, for our meal. And I look down and sure the bill's going to be shocking because we're in downtown Disney at 6.30 p.m. on a weeknight. And I looked down, but it wasn't the bill that was shocking. It was a special drink that my husband had ordered that was um, ex as expensive as my burger. So I look down and I see it and I'm like, excuse me. And I'm holding Millie <laughs> in one hand. And I said, excuse me. And I'm standing up looking down at him like this, like what any good humble wife should do, right? <laughs> excuse me. We are not these people, okay? Like, I don't know if Chatty, Chatty and Hyde. <laughs> Chatty and Hyde. Heidi and Chad. I don't know if they are these people but, or if you guys are these people, but we are not these people who like make a scene in the middle of downtown Disney. But I said, what makes you think that we can afford a zillion dollar drink on a trip to the hospital for our daughter? And he's, and we do not do this. So he's shocked and he throws his hands up, literally goes, whoa, 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 whoa. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we are those people. Like we are those people. We are having marriage problems in the middle of downtown Disney. I have marriage problems and Disneyland. So I said, whatever, like, let's not do this right now because we're not those people. Let's just take a walk. I need to find a quiet place. And he's like, yeah, good luck with that, babe. So I'm like, we're going to go. As I'm walking away, he has, you can take that picture down now if you want, that's fine. Or keep it up forever, I don't, whatever you decide to do. As we're walking away, I see that someone had left crayons and color paper for Jane, the waitress had. And it just hit my heart and my spirit started to break. And we did find a quiet place to sit by this little waterfall miraculously and I told Rich, let's just sit down, I need to just talk this out and I told him, what kind of doofus brings crayons and colored paper to a disabled blind child? He said, it's not about the drink. It's not about the drink. It's not about the drink. I'm so tired of being down here. And I said, but if she hadn't brought crayons and colored paper to her, what kind of doofus would not bring crayons and colored paper to a disabled blind child? Nobody's winning in this scenario. I'm just breaking down. I'm so emotional. I said, we come here all the time. We pray and we give our lives and she is not healed. And I know God is faithful, but we literally pretend like apparently you're celebrating something buying this expensive drink. What are we celebrating? Celebrating. She's sick. She's not getting better. We walk in circles around the outside of Disneyland. It's in every way feeling like we are right outside the gates. We are right outside the gates of the best. We are right outside the gates of the more. We are right outside the gates of where everybody wants to be, but we're here. And I broke down and Rich, of course he understood because he's the only one who can really walk through this with me. And we mended and there was a healing moment there, but immediately after this happened, my dear friend Tasha, who's the worship pastor at the Father's House in Vacaville, she Marco Polo's me with that app. It's a video app if you guys don't have it. So she sends me a video and she's curling her hair in her robe in the video right after I just like cussed out my husband in the middle of downtown Disney. She has no idea what is going on. She's like, hey Hill, I just wanted to ask you, like, would you be willing to speak at our women's thing in a couple months? Like, is that good? And I'm like, sure yeah I just like almost beat my husband in the middle of like the happiest place on earth and you want me to preach to our women this is great this is great and also I hadn't spoke for a year I had taken a year off because of the anxiety because of the PTSD and because of all the things that we were up against but you know what I did I messaged her back and I said yes yes I would love to and then three months later, there was 1,800 women who gathered, and I spoke a word about disappointment that I want to speak to you guys tonight. And people got set free, and they had chains broken off of them. And I've spoken more this year than I have in many years in the past. And I just wonder what would have happened had I stayed in that place of disappointment, had I not said yes. And I just want to encourage you tonight, no matter what you're going through, all it takes is a yes. All it takes is a yes. 
You might think, I don't have anything left to give. I have nothing. You have no idea what I've gone through. You have no idea what I'm going through in my marriage, with my kids, with my family, with my job. I don't care if you have nothing left. You still have something, and it's a yes. You still have a yes. All you have to do is say yes. God, wherever you want to take me, yes. If you want me to speak, yes. If you want me to serve, yes. If you want me to lead, yes. If you want me to forgive them, yes. If you want me to break up with them, yes. If you want me to give more money, yes. You always have a yes. Don't let the enemy convince you that you have nothing. Because when you have nothing, you still have something. You still have a yes. I want to talk to you tonight about giving God your yes. Giving him your yes. Despite what you've experienced, despite unmet expectations, giving him your yes. Thank you. Amen. Thank, can we thank Mr. Nord, piano? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> In John chapter 6, you guys can go there with me if you want. This is going to be our text tonight. There is a picture painted of a lot of people who are saying yes to Jesus. There are crowds of people following him. They've heard of him. They want his miracles. They want his wonders. They want more of God. They are following him all around the region. They want him so much that it says that they're going to force him to be their king. He's not offering it. They're going to mob rush him and say, you're going to be our king. That's how much they love Jesus. They're passionate about his, what he's doing, and they want to be on their team. There is a yes in their hearts. Do you guys remember when you first made Jesus your king? And there was just that fiery yes in your heart. And you were like, God, you can have everything. Like, I will break my CDs for you. Like, I will totally break up with him through instant message. Like, it is not a problem. Like, I will do this right now. For me, I was 13. It was at youth camp. I'm just slowly trying to get this water lit off, so just bear with me. There we go. It was at youth camp, and I experienced the power of the Holy Spirit so tangibly. And I came home and told my mom, I want to be homeschooled because I want to serve at the church more. And I did, I was like, I'm not going to listen to Brandy anymore. That was my big... That was my big secular CD, Brandy. Yeah, the boy is mine, the boy is mine, the boy is mine, the boy is mine, the boy is mine. If you don't know that song, I'm so sad for you. You need to go look it up, yeah. Oh, you need to give it up. Anybody? No. There's my person, there she is. Oh, in the back, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, thank you. So I was like, I'll break brandy, and I will follow Jesus. And I would read any book that had the title Esther in it. I was like, if it says Esther, it's for me, because obviously that's who I am. I am an Esther to this generation. I was going to be homeschooled. I was going to go to every conference available. And I was obsessed with purity, which we should all be at all stages of our life. But also a certain song by a woman named Rebecca St. James. Do you guys remember her? Hey, guess what, guys? She's doing great. She got married. I Googled her. I was really happy about that. I'm like, if I Google her and she's still single, that is a curse because we need to get that mended because she wrote a song called Waiting for You. And if you haven't heard it, that's okay. I'll sing it for you real quick. So I would lay in bed at night and sing this song to myself as I fell asleep. Mm, that's not healthy. Let me just <laughs> drop a thing of wisdom for you. If you're single, falling asleep singing, I am waiting for, praying for you, darling. That's psychotic. So stop it and don't do that. But that was me at 14 and 15 and thir all, probably like three years I did that. Uh -huh. You're like, well, it turned out fine for you. Yeah, but you know, let's not follow Miss Hillary here. But I was doing it one night. My mom came in. <laughs> I'm singing with my Walkman on. Wait for me to, wait for me as I wait for you. I am waiting for, wait for me. She walks in, honey, are you singing? Pitch black, middle of the night, in my parents' house, and I'm like, pull up the covers, no. No. She's like, okay, well, good night. I'm like, good night. So, I love Jesus, I was pure, but I was also a pathological liar, so I don't know. At least I wasn't smoking pot, okay? Except, I don't know, it's kind of like a toss-up at this point, what was healthier for my soul at that moment. <laughs> but 
That was me loving Jesus, giving him everything. And that's where these people are. They are in the middle of just getting to know Jesus. And they finally catch up to him and they say, God, we, Jesus, we, all the same, we want to do your works. And then they ask him this. They asked him, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. I love this. They're like, you did something for them. Yeah, you did something for them. So like, what are you going to do for me? And I love this because like, we're going to force you to be our king. Oh yeah, we are all about you. But like, so what are you going to do for us? Like, we love you, but what are you going to do? I believe you, but I would really believe you. You know, I believe you, but if you brought a spouse into my life, I would really believe you. I believe you, but if you healed my daughter, then I would really believe you. I believe you, but if you just caused that girl and that guy to break up so I could get in there, I would really (laughs) believe you. You can have it all, but God, you would be even more powerful for me if you did something. What will you do for me? And Jesus says, whoa, 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 I think you're getting this wrong. I think you're getting this wrong. To have more of me, to be all consumed by me, it's not about what what I can do for you. And he says this in verse 48, and he tears their world upside down. He says, I am the bread of life. I don't just do things for the sake of doing things. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors, yeah, they ate manna in the desert, but they died. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood, (laughs) this is getting real, this is getting real twilighty up in this scenario. Whoever, these people, they've been on my team all night, and I'm just like, yes, okay. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. They remain in me, and I in them. Verse 60, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And you're like, no kidding, it's cannibalism. This is a hard teaching. (laughs) what are you talking about? Some of you got invited tonight and you're like, we need to go. (laughs) This is a cult for sure. (laughs) The signs are pointing to the exit. She's talking about cannibalism. No, it's cool. It's cool. Let me explain myself. They knew that he was not talking about actual cannibalism. There were religions at the time, these mystic pagan religions where people would want to be all consumed with a god, a pagan god. And they would go through a a series of purifications and festivals, and it would be this all-consuming senses. So they would see it, they would smell it, they would hear it, there would be music. And at the accumulation of these festivals, they would sit down and have this grand meal where they would eat something, and it would be like they were consuming the pagan god, and finally, like the precipice of becoming one with that god. So Jesus knew that they knew what he would be talking about. And he says, if you want me, you have to consume all of me, my glory and possibly my suffering. There might be a cross involved, but if you want me, you have to take every part of me. And if you take all of me, I'm also going to need all of you even if it's things that you didn't want to give up, even if it's expectations that I don't meet on your timeline and in your way, I need all of you. If you want to go to the next level, it's not a miracle I need to do for you. I need complete oneness with you. It says from this point on, many of his disciples turned away and no longer followed him. Disciples, You're like, oh, well, that would never be me. Oh, my gosh, I tithe all the time, more than once a week. I just tithe always. I love God more than anything. Only Caleb on my radio, sister. Like, absolutely. I read Ecclesiastes every night, all the time. The Bible app is playing 24-7. I would never walk away from the Lord my God. 
No, no, no. It says many disciples turned away and no longer followed him. Disciples, parking lot volunteers, small group leaders, worship team members, people on staff, administrators, small group leaders, people who called themselves disciples. By definition, people who sat under the teaching of Jesus, they walked away. Why? Because the cost was too much. Because the pain might have been uncomfortable. It says that Jesus looks to his remaining 12 after the disciples walked away. He looks at his remaining 12 disciples and says, are you going to go too? Do you also want to leave? And this is not sassy Jesus, okay? This is not like, so you're going to go too? So you're probably going to go too, right? Everybody's leaving. Go. I don't even care. Get out of here. It doesn't matter to me. It's not what Jesus is saying. This is the Father Jesus. He knows that they know that following him might mean a cross is coming. He knows that they know that following him will ruin their reputation. He knows that they will have to leave everything. He knows that expectations might not get met. So he's giving them a father heart opportunity. And he's saying, hey, there's some rough stuff coming up. Do you want to go? If you want to leave, now would be okay. You can go. They have an opportunity here to make a decision. And what does Peter reply? My man Peter, in verse 68, says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and to know, not just believe, but we know that you are the Holy One of God. Where else can we go? Oh, girls, I have been in this situation where I'm like, God, you are just not healing my kid. I am watching her have seizures. I am watching her vomit on herself. I am experiencing anxiety attacks that won't go away. I'm a preacher at our church. You have to fix something. You know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to just go, and I'm going to go do yoga for hours. And that'll show you. Yeah. I'm shopping. I'm going to shop the heck out of all of this pain. I'm just going to shop, shop. I'm going to go camping. Uh Uh-huh, I'm going to go on like one of those camping yoga retreats, and I'm just going to give it all over to the Buddhas or whoever they are that can't bring healing to me, but it'll make me feel better because I will. No, where else can I go? Where else can I go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You alone are the Holy One of God. And I have come to believe and I have come to know that there is no plan B. There is no other option. I have seen too much and it has cost me too much and I am not leaving now. If you want to take me to a cross, take me to a cross. Where else can I go? And ladies, this is your moment. This is the deciding moment where you get to cross from condition to covenant. There's a line in the sand that says, do you want to go? I know it hasn't worked out for you like you thought it would work out. I know you thought you'd be married by now. I know you haven't got the job. I know they turned their back on you. Do you want to go? And you get to say, where else can I go? You alone. And covenant has something that condition will never have. Covenant brings intimacy. And intimacy is a familiarity that comes only through staying and continuing with somebody. Condition says, well, I didn't like it. We broke up. Well, they didn't meet my needs. I didn't meet theirs, so we gone. But covenant says, I made a promise long ago. And even though you jacked up and I'm jacked up, we're in this and I am staying. You see, the ones who stayed, they got to see a part of Jesus that other people never got to see. They got to be there when his body was taken off of the cross. They got to see him put in a rich man's tomb. They got to see the hands that would be crucified for their life wash their dirty, stinky, hairy man feet. The hands of the Savior touching their dirty feet. 
intimacy. They got to see the very same hands walk to them in their room and say, see the scars in my hands, I died for you. They got to see him ascend. They got to see things that nobody else got to see. But so many people don't get to see the deeper things of God because they walk away because they're trapped. They're trapped in confusion, in disappointment, in unmet expectations, and they say, it's going to cost too much. I just don't think I can take another step forward. Earlier in the story, Jesus actually tells them, when he said what it would cost them, he hears them mumbling to themselves, and they're like, oh, they're, they're grappling with this thing. we got to eat his flesh. We gotta, it's got to be all-consuming. What are we going to do? And Jesus looks at them, and he says, hey, what I'm saying to you, does this offend you? Does it offend you, what I'm saying? And that word offense means to entrap or trip up. So he was literally asking them, are you going to get trapped in what I just said? Or are you going to move forward with me? Are you going to trip over the cost? Are you going to move forward? So many people can't move forward into the deeper things of God, into the more, into the intimacy, because they're trapped in disappointment. They're trapped in the unmet expectations. You know, it was probably two and a half years ago that I first went and saw a friend and counselor because the anxiety and panic was so out of the blue and got so bad, I was like, I need help. Turned out she diagnosed me with PTSD from everything that happened with my daughter. We had spent so much time in hospitals and um, emergency situations that I just didn't feel safe anywhere. And she also told me, Hillary, she's an extremely prophetic woman. Let me paint you a picture. She was raised from the dead at our church. Literally. Like, she died at our church, and then she was raised from the dead. So that's, that's who was counseling me. No pressure, right? So I'm receiving counseling from Lazarus, and no biggie. I come in with all my issues. I'm like, hello. Um, what do I do with you? But she said, Hillary, I sense, she's extremely prophetic, I sense that you might, there might be disappointment. I think at the root of all this, there might be disappointment. And I, are you disappointed? And I said, no, I don't, I don't think disappointed, huh? Like, I'm so blessed. Like, I'm just, like, so blessed. Like, always lived in Vacaville. And, like, my husband and I stayed pure. Like, I'm just so blessed. Like, I don't think I'm disappointed. And then I was like, well, like, yes, oh, my God. And I cried for an hour and a half straight over being so flippin' disappointed. And she said, yeah, I felt like the Lord might be saying that. I'm like, yeah, so casual. I'm like, yeah, I think you might have been right. I think you hit a nerve. I don't, I'm not sure. She said, I want you to go home and I want you to make a list about all the things you're disappointed by. And I want you to come and bring it back here next week. So I did that and I brought my list and it was a long list. I'm disappointed that my daughter can't talk. I'm disappointed that doctors didn't catch it sooner. I'm disappointed that other families don't have to deal with this. I'm disappointed that people my age don't have to be full-time caregivers to their disabled kid. I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed. Disappointed. She said, that was really good. That was a good exercise. Now, where on your list did you put God? Did you write God's name down? And I'm like, how do you mean? Like, God, he's the answer to everything. What are you saying? She's like, no, no. Did you tell God that you're disappointed in him? I'm like, are you allowed to do that? <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was in the manual, if I was allowed to be. And she said, Hillary, if you were disappointed in God, don't you think he would already know about that? I'm like, oh, wow, that is such a good point. That's why they call you pastor, because you are full of wisdom. So I left the counseling appointment early, and I went in my car and parked in a quiet nature space, and I spent an hour banging my fists on the steering wheel, telling God how disappointed I was in him. How he hurt me because he was my friend, and I had served him, and I had given up so many things for him. How could he let these things happen? And I just walked through it with him, and we talked it out. I wish I could tell you that at the end of that, everything broke and everything got better and I never experienced anxiety again and my daughter walked the next day but the truth is none of that happened but what did happen is I came to believe and I came to know and we walked through it together 
and I made a decision that I was going to stay. Band, you can come up. Please, thank you. There's people in the room tonight. You need to make a decision that you're going to stay. That even when you don't see it change, even when it's not what you thought, you are going to continue and you are going to walk it through with Jesus and you are going to remain and you are going to stay. Even when it has hurt, even when it's not what you expected, even when the cost is too high, you will keep going, you will cross over from condition to covenant and you will stay. I remember being in the third grade and my mom forgot me at school. I know, hard transition right here. You're like, wow, we're onto another story, apparently. <laughs> yes. And it was carpool, so it was me and my friend, like second or third grade, and we were at a country school up at Lake Berryessa. So there's a very small amount of people there, so it cleaned out. Someone from Lake Berryessa? Shut up. Middletown, what? I don't know what that means. Well, what? Okay. Middletown, I'm all, yeah, represent it, whatever it is. Um, yeah, <laughs> the chances of me not knowing it, and we're both from there, anyways. Okay, and I just like want to talk to you now. I'm like, so like, what did you, what's your name and stuff? But that's not what this is about. We'll talk after. Um, Lake Berryessa, little school, me and my friend were left there. That's the point of this. And my mom forgot us, so there's nobody left. We're sitting up against the wall, the brick wall, with the cougar painted on the back. And like 45 minutes go by, nobody left, nobody left. And I remember the principal is this like big guy with broad shoulders and dark hair. And he turns the corner and he sees us and he says, <gasps> and he startles. And I had never seen him startle before. He was the intimidating Mr. Bolton. And Mr. Bolton did not startle. And he's probably six feet tall. And he turns the corner and he sees two little grade schoolers alone. No parents, 45 minutes after school is over, and he clicks back, and he says something that I'll never forget. He says, you're still here. You're still here, with a question mark in his voice. And I had never seen him so startled or vulnerable. And that's what I remember most about this scenario. It's like, wow, I've never seen Mr. Bolton look so weak before. He's so tall and intimidating, but he looks very weak and surprised and vulnerable right now. There's many of you in the room tonight where you are just remaining in your situation. And the enemy seems so intimidating because when he's attacking you and he's berating you with lies and disappointment and discouragement and fatigue in your journey, he just seems so tall and so intimidating. But he is turning a corner tonight, ladies. He's gonna turn a corner tonight, ladies. And the enemy that was attacking you and berating you and seemed to have so much control over your life, he's gonna startle. And he's going to startle and he's going to say, you're still here. You're still here. I thought you'd be gone. I thought I got you. I thought, I thought that I got you. I thought that that sickness would have taken you out. I thought that your brokenness would have taken you out. I thought that your marriage would have been too overwhelming. I thought that you knew how addicted you were. I thought that addiction got you. What are you doing in the waters of baptism? You're still here. You're still here. You're still here. Stand up tonight in the room if you're still here. Tell the enemy, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still going to keep walking. I'm still going to keep going. I'm going to step over the line. It doesn't. I'm still here. It may hurt. It may cost a lot. It may not be what I expect, but I'm going to go. I'm going to stay. I might not get what I want, but I'm still here. I might not see what I want, but I'm still here. Right. Because this isn't about what you can do for me. This is about how deep in relationship I can go with you. And I will go with you. If you take me to a cross, I will go with you. Oh, I am still here. And I'm not going anywhere. Where else can I go? Where else can I go? You alone. You alone have the words of eternal life. You alone are the Holy One of God. You alone can heal me. You alone can set me free. You alone can heal my daughter. You alone can heal my marriage. So where else can I go? 
Where else can I go? I'm still here. I'm still here. I still say yes. Yeah. Yes. If that's you tonight, if you can close your eyes all around this room and you need to say yes to God, I just want you to raise your hand. If you're in a situation, maybe for the first time you need to say yes to God, or if you need to decide, I will continue. It's not what I thought, but I will continue. I want you to raise both hands to Jesus right now. We're going to make a declaration. We're going to sing this song out. If you guys know it, we sang it out earlier. But we're going to make a declaration that we're going to follow him no matter where he takes us. That we are not going to be picked off. The, the biggest weapon you have against the enemy is not when God has given you all the money and all the healing and all the attributes and then you get up and praise Jesus. No, the weapon that you have is a sacrifice of praise when you have no money, no healing, no breakthrough and still you say, Jesus, I will go. Jesus, I will go. Tell, begin to sing it out over your situation. Pick out that situation in your mind. If it's your marriage you need to contend for, if it's your family, if it's healing, if it's just a thing that says, God, you hurt me, but I forgive you and I am going on. You have my best interest in mind. Listen, he will not leave you there. He will seek you out like a bloodhound. He will find you. There is no door too high. There is nothing. There's no wall he won't kick down, whatever he can't tear down, however that song says it. Nothing. He is for you. He is good. You're his girl, and he wants you. He wants to take you not just to a cross, but he wants to take you to a resurrection. He wants to see you excel. He wants to see you run. He wants to see you free. Free from the idea of what you think following him is. Free from preconceived notions. He wants to take you into deep, intimate places, but you have to say yes, no matter what the cost, no matter what the cost. Even if you don't, even if you don't, we will never bow. Even if you don't, we will never bow. Every hand raised in this place, just begin to lift up your own song to God, your own prayer. Tell him that thing that's bothering you. Tell him that thing you need to give him. I'm going to have the band start singing this uh, bridge in the back. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking to. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking to. Tell him you're going to follow him wherever he takes you. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking to. Make it your prayer. Make it your declaration. If you walked out of the grave.